This is the Small Mouth Crush Podcast. If you're a hardcore angler, you've come to the right place. This is a weekly podcast that will interview some of the top smallmouth bass anglers in North America. Travis and his guest will discuss what it takes to consistently catch big smallmouth, and you'll get a glimpse inside the mind of a trophy smallmouth angler. And now, here's your host of the Small Mouth Crush Podcast, Travis Manson. I want to take a moment to talk about our fine sponsors of this podcast. If it wasn't for them, we wouldn't be here. This is a real shot. Back in my home state of Wisconsin, pretty big tackle store. they got a lot going on over there. If you're in the area, I encourage you to check them out. If you're from out of the state and you want to see the selection, their online store is amazing. Uh, www.therealshot.com is where you can find all your bass fishing tackle needs. And, of course, if you look in the show description, you're going to find a link. If you use that link, it just helps out the channel, helps out the podcast. Let them know Smallmouth Crush sent you. Another great product, the Monster Bass Box, okay? This box here is full of amazing baits that you're going to get at your doorstep, shipped to you every month. Monsterbass.com is the website. You can use the code TRAVIS10 right now to uh, get a little discount on your first purchase over at Monster Bass. And, of course, I want to give a shout-out to Bowers Marine. They're located near Reading, Pennsylvania. So if you're looking for a new boat, new bass boat, uh, they're actually the second largest, I believe. I also want to give a shout-out to Bowers Marine. My dealer, when it comes to, to bass boats, although they have a, a wide variety of different boats that they sell, second oldest tracker, nitro tracker dealer in the country, that's where I get my Nitro, my Nitro Z21s. They're also a Ranger dealer. So if you're in the market for a new boat, I encourage you to head on over to their website or stop in the store and tell them Smallmouth Crush sent you. I also want to keep in mind, this is my first attempt, okay, season one, talking about the 52 top smallmouth anglers in the country. We're going to have weekly shows and sometimes the guests are a little bit remote, okay? So they might be on their cell phone at a hotel room or on the way to a tournament. It's hard to get 52 guys to sit down with a microphone, camera, and a computer and get some great audio. So we're going to have to struggle. Hey, I can do my, my part, okay? My end, we're good to go. Their end, hey, I want to bring you the, the knowledge and the secrets and help you catch bigger small mouth and learn from from the top guys out there and so we're gonna we're gonna get that information however we can so i, I just want to apologize ahead of time if the audio in these podcasts sometimes are not the greatest i do apologize sometimes it's, it's just it is what it is welcome to the small mouth crush podcast my name is travis manson my guest today matt becker he fishes on the flw tackle warehouse pro tour and he is a heck of a smallmouth stick, knows how to catch some big, big old smallmouth way offshore. He's a Great Lakes guy. He has a lot of experience, so you guys are going to want to really pay attention to some of these nuggets that he's going to be giving up. We're definitely going to be talking a little bit of drop shotting and talking about a little bit of pre-spawn crankbait fishing for smallmouth. So I'm looking forward to this one. Let's get into it. Real good smallmouth stick well a good stick all around this dude knows what he's talking about i got matt becker he's he's uh he's in a hotel somewhere what's going on today man what are you doing are well, you fishing no fishing i'm currently boatless so uh oh. i'm in the process of picking up the 2021 rig yeah uh, yeah on the road what are you getting are you, you're with phoenix obviously is yeah. it the, uh yeah getting a 21 phx phoenix Nice, nice. That's, uh, that's a good big water boat, so it I, is. I just keep rolling with that one. Sure. Right now, this this past year, you had, uh, I mean, a pretty decent season, I would say, by by anyone's standards. Are you, I mean, are you looking forward to next year? What are some, uh, you know, what are some lakes that you're looking forward to going? I know the schedule's out now. What would be like number one on your list of of what what you're really excited about, or, or and and your goals for next year as well? Twenty twenty was. A crazy year, but it was pretty awesome, and uh, the schedule was pretty good for it. And then I uh, went and got changed up. So, mm -hmm. looking forward to a set schedule for 2021. Hopefully, hopefully. yeah, hopefully. And uh, we got a couple events up north in in smallmouth country, and uh, 
I'm a fan of that. Sure, sure. So right now you're li- you live in in Pennsylvania. You want yeah. you want to tell everybody kind of your, you know, let's just go real quick about your background, and you know when you got into fishing. How you know there's not a a whole lot of opportunities in in PA. Right. I mean, there's there's enough, but it's not like other parts of the country. Yeah. So where where are you living now? So I'm in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh. area. Yep. So yeah, I grew up fishing on um, three rivers around Pittsburgh, which is notoriously horrible for bass fishing. Sure. So that kind of helped me grow as an angler at a young age and learn how to fish in tough fisheries. And then, you know, only a couple hours away is Lake Erie. Mm-hmm. So I would take a couple trips up there a year with, you know, with my dad. My dad has got me into fishing and uh, we were always fishing every chance we got. So a couple times a year, he would take me up to Erie and I got to experience that side of it. And I quickly fell in love with, with Lake Erie. And uh, once I, you know, got a truck and a boat from my own, I started spending a lot of my time up there just because it was such a better fishery. So sure. That's I don't blame you. Yeah. yeah, that's where I really learned like what I was doing and how to use electronics and, and how to, you know, kind of target bigger fish mm-hmm. with all those trips up to Lake Erie. Sure, sure. As far as, you know, the Great Lakes, obviously, they're um, all of them are amazing places to fish. Mm-hmm. You know, you said you struggled or, or you, you fished the, the Three Rivers area. That's been that's been a tough a tough deal right it's it's yeah for some reason it's always been tough right is it getting oh, yeah. better is the fishery getting better is it uh could it get better you know it's really not as bad as it it, it seemed in some of those events you know the Bassmaster classic was sure. there and it was the lowest weight in history um the forestwood cup was there and they caught them a little better mm-hmm. the weights were a little bit higher but it's still never going to get anything above, you know, two, three pound class fish. Wow. They're, they're just, the growing season isn't long enough and uh-huh. uh, just the forage isn't the there. The food source, sure. Yeah, it's just not there for them to, to grow that size. So it's it's just a lot of small fish, but it's not like it's a bad fishery or any means. It's healthy. You know, you can go and catch 20, 30 fish a day, but they're just small. Right, right. No, I, I love talking with anglers that fish the Great Lakes. I, I mean, you're speaking my style. I, I can't think of a better system, body of water to fish. It's a it's, different breed, isn't it's it? It's amazing. It, it's unique. I mean, would you agree you fished a handful of different uh, – well, maybe maybe you fished them all. Have you fished every Great Lake out there? Or you, have, have you been to Superior or Huron? I have not been out to the west western ones. But. Okay, yeah, Superior – uh, you, you fished Michigan recent, well, this past, this past summer, uh, my home body of water where I grew up. What did you think of Lake Michigan and the Bay of Green Bay and that area? Was that your first time there? Yes. Okay. Well, no, I was there last, last spring. I took a trip up there for, okay. for the spawning, but yes, this year was my first real, uh, real experience with mm-hmm. it. And, uh, it's crazy how every Great Lake's a little different sure. and uh, has different characteristics, different depths, different structures, different water clarities even. But, yeah, I love uh, Sturgeon Bay and, and Lake Michigan area. There's just uh, a lot of fish up there, a lot of everything, walleye, a lot of, uh, you know, smallmouth and, and sure. a lot of other species around as well. You could, you could target all the different things you wanted in uh, the same areas. It's amazing. So, you know, that area, the Bay of Green Bay, uh, Lake Michigan, Sturgeon Bay. You're right. There's so many different species. There's there's a lot of good guides that that guide out of that region that are multi-species anglers. So you have uh, some real good, you know, really bass and walleye guys combined in that in that zone. And the trout and salmon fishing is amazing there. Right. But you know, we're here to talk about the smallmouth. I w- I want to know what you know. Growing up, I guess in in the Pittsburgh area, I'm going to assume you fished mostly uh, out of Erie, PA? Yes. For the most part, maybe Buffalo in that zone? Yeah, yeah. Um, the Erie, PA. Press and, and, sure, yeah. And so the Eastern Basin versus the Western Basin of Erie is a pretty different animal as well. Uh, mm-hmm. How did that compare, your home body water compare? What were some of the similarities uh, that you found on Lake Michigan? Yeah, so what I've noticed is once you figure out one Great Lake, they all fish pretty similar. It's more so the depth range that you're looking at. 
Mm. You know, they're all going to set up, um, you know, it's all current related. So they're all setting up on the structure the same ways. Sure. It's just figuring out each lake has a different depth range. It seems like they like to be in. Uh, so yeah, absolutely. It, it's kind of figuring out that depth range that you need to focus on. After that, it's all just uh, pretty much the same stuff. Sure. You know, did did you find forward. did did you find that that you, those fish were a little shallower than you expected at times, or was it more mid range or deeper fish? In Michigan, like yeah. Michigan, yes, it seemed like they were a little bit shallower than I expected. Right. Yeah. So so the eastern the eastern basin of Lake Erie, of course, they do get shallow, but uh, I mean, I don't know if you agree with this, but there's times you can find fish in that 60 foot range. I've got them out to a hundred. Sure. Right. Right. There's no, no limit to how deep they'll go. And right. uh, I, I honestly think a lot of the biggest fish in the lake do that all summer long. And, mm-hmm. you know, they may not even be relating to any structure. They may just be following bait around or whatnot, but sure. they're, they're out there in the abyss. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Absolutely. It, it's funny because, um, in my opinion, if I was to fish, the Bay of Green Bay and, and Lake Michigan, uh, my main focus would be in that, especially in the middle of the summer, uh, that 18 to, do I dare say 30? Probably not. 18 to 20, 25. Yeah. Uh, would you agree with that? I mean, I'm, I'm not saying there's, no. yeah, yeah. It's, it's, it's really, it's a re, really unique fishery. I'm not saying that they don't get deeper, but if you want to consistently get on a good pattern, that's always a good depth range to start. Where if we head out to Lake Erie, man, yeah. it, it's a different ball game. I guess you know the next question would be what would be some of the the differences that you saw as far as structure and things like that. Uh, was there anything that kind of stood out in your mind? So there's there's more rock for sure than like like Erie per se. Mm-hmm. You know Erie has a lot of sand in it, so you're more so trying to eliminate the sandy areas and find the, the rocky. Sure. Rock, rock piles, the rock shoals, or, or whatever. Um, right, right. Seemed like Lake Michigan and Green Bay area had a lot more rock around, mm-hmm. and uh, so you had to kind of eliminate some areas and and find the little drops or the broken sure. up rock or whatever they were they were focused on. Sure. Yeah, there can be some uh, there can be some amazing shallow uh, sight fishing opportunities on on Lake Michigan and Sturgeon Bay. Mm-hmm. Did you explore any of those uh, patterns? Uh, you know, conditions obviously have to be right. You have to have, you know, some real good clean water, which oftentimes, it, it, especially in that Sturgeon Bay area, there's some places where it can get dirty depending on the wind, but you can oftentimes find some clear water. Uh, did you did you poke around up shallow at all and see some fish cruising, or did you just focus more on, on the on the deeper fish at during during those events this past year? I focused on the deeper fish. You know, there's a little bit of an algae bloom going on. So sure. it yeah. had a kind of greenish color to it. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, you couldn't really see much more than two or three feet down. Sure. Um, you know, see well anyway. You can see yep. the bottom, but, but to really, you know, sneak yeah. up on those fish, you need good Yeah, you got to have the right conditions. And it, it sounds yeah. like that didn't, didn't quite happen there. Uh, right. as, far as, as far as Lake Erie, what would be, you know, I guess as an angler, when you when you fish it so much, you, you kind of there's got to be a season or a time frame that you really look forward to. Uh, what would that time frame be for for your home body of water, Lake Erie? Mm, I mean, they're all so different. I sure. love them all. You know? Right, right. If like, you had to pick one, if I had to pick one, I mean, it's going to be pre spawn in the spring. Oh, when, really? Okay. Yeah, they they get on a crankbait pretty good, so. Uh, you know, you can go and, and position the boat in one spot and throw it, you know, one boulder per se and, and catch, you know, 30 or 40 off. Of wow. So boulder. let's let's dig into that because that that's a real interesting technique that, you know, a lot of people when they think Great Lakes and they think smallmouth, you know, of course, drop shots and tubes and stuff like that come to mind. Mm-hmm. Maybe some jerk baiting. Uh, but the crankbait game, that's, that's intriguing. Um, in fact, the first time I experienced a real true crankbait bite for me was was out of uh, Lake Erie. I think I was out of um, uh, I can't think of the name now. The uh, south of Buffalo, Dunkirk area. Dunkirk. Dunkirk. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, how do you go about that? I, I mean, I want to talk baits. I want to talk patterns. Yeah. Uh, you know, if, are, when are you throwing the crankbait? 
Like, it, was this pre-spawn? Yes. Yeah, so really? How, what's the water temp? Water temps uh, in the 50s. Okay, okay. Yeah. It, it's, uh, you know, mid to low 50s, right before they're getting ready to spawn. Sure. And, uh, you know, really, I got a couple areas where they, they kind of slide in and stage before they, they move up onto the, the flats to spawn. Okay. So there's a couple little rocky areas with that scenario, and uh, you you can just hammer them on a crankbait. Sure. Um, Surely you can catch them on other baits. You know, you could drag a a drop shot or a tube through there, Mm -hmm. but it's not often that those big ones, especially like to react to a crankbait. Right. So I like to take full advantage of that. Yeah. Well, heck yeah. So, so a staging area is what you're looking for uh, uh, just outside of a flat or an area where they're going to spawn. You're looking at temperatures, you know, in, in those mid-50 ranges, how, what's the depth that you're targeting? I mean, w- I guess, what what type of crankbait are you using and what depth are you are you looking? So, or, or do you use different size yeah, crankbaits? Okay. It, it depends on, on the, the situation, but mm-hmm. um, usually it's around that, say, 10 to 15 foot range. Okay. Um, maybe 8 to 15, depending on, on the areas. Um you know, this year I was really catching them good on a Bagley Killer B too. Sure, great you know, crank bro, bit, yeah. Bro rock crawler, a DT10, all those sort of 10 to 15 foot diving crankbaits. Okay. Um, you just honestly, you don't even have to hit the rock when they're that aggressive. Sure. Small moth are, are a little different than large moth, whereas they will hit a crankbait coming up at it, like yep. we're not hitting anything. Um. But if you could, you know, get it down there, deflect it off a rock, or uh, pause it for a second, they would just absolutely hammer it. So gotcha. So so a variety of cranks. The, you mentioned the rock crawler, DT10, a bomber. Is there any particular colors that you like to focus in on? Is it is it more bait fish? Is it more uh, a red crawdad color? Uh, what are you looking for when it comes to, uh, you know, the actual color of the of those crank baits? I was going with uh, a gold or a chartreuse to uh, mm. more imitate a perch. Sure. Yeah, okay. they really seem to get on the perch early gotcha. in the year. Okay, yep. So that's what I was trying to imitate with that. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, any kind of chartreuse craw or, you know, gold, sure. gold striped, um, any any type of bait like that that puts off a, a perch imitation is uh, going right. to catch there in the spring. Sure. Now your retrieve, is it a... A standard retrieve are, are you are you stop and go is it a, uh, are you burning it what, what would be would you find the most effective way to, to bring that through those rock piles and, and in those areas in that 8 to 15 foot range yeah that was the cool thing is you could you could kind of change with them so when, whenever you pull up on a fresh group of fish you could just throw it out there and just wind it in regularly but after you caught you know 10 or 12 of them mm-hmm. kind of get smart to your tricks a little bit so sure you got to switch it up and give them a pause or burn it or, or, or pop it. Something a little different. So hold on. 10 to 15 fish. I mean, what's a good day out there doing this pattern that time of year? I mean, so what? Can- this spring, I, I went three days in a row and uh, I didn't break 100, but I was in the 90s all day. Wow. Okay. Ago. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. Yeah. And, and size, I mean, are we? Are, do you find that the areas that you're focusing on, do they have a bunch of uh, two and three pounders as well as some fives and sixes mixed in or are they is it grouped up by size w- what do you find that time of year with this pattern they're mostly mixed up you know between mm-hmm. that two and a half to five and a half pound range sure is what i found this year yeah um which is honestly one of the characteristics of lake erie itself which is different than some of the other lakes is lake erie seems to have a lot of like three and a half to four and a half pound class fish yep whereas if you say had uh, lake ontario sure it seems to have a little void in that area but it has the bigger fives and six i totally agree i i've said this before i feel that lake erie has the most four pound smallmouth in any of the great lakes out there as far as numbers for sure yeah and, and yeah, don't get me wrong, there's some giants in there too. Well, yes, for sure. But if you catch a 20 pound bag on Erie, it's going to be like five, four pounders, mm-hmm. you know, or a four and a half and a three and a half. But you're going to have sure 
five of the same four pounders, you know? Right, right, right. Now your crankbait setup, what size line? Uh, do you, are you a fiberglass type of guy with a rod or a graphite? Or what, what do you look for in the perfect, you know, that, that type of scenario uh, when you're throwing, throwing crankbaits? You know, I've messed with them all. And uh, every situation is a little different. But I've settled on a composite glass rod. Sure. For yeah. small mouth cranking, especially because you're really not bumping the bottom or, or trying to feel exactly what you're doing. You're just kind of waiting for them to load up on it. So it's sure. a little bit more forgiving and uh, allows you to fight the fish better. So it's it's a favorite fat glass cranking rod. It's a 7.4 medium heavy okay. cranking rod. And sure. uh, that's what I've settled on here lately. Sure. And then uh, 10, 12 pound fluorocarbon, mono, Yeah, braid. no. I go sh straight fluorocarbon. Okay. Um, I mix it up from 10 to 15 sure. depending on, uh, the bait I'm using, you know, you could, you could, uh, mm -hmm. put 15 on a little bit deeper diving bait and keep it up. So you, you can mess with your, your line size and the bait you're using to, uh, really dial in your presentation. But so sure. I would put you yeah, anywhere between 10 and 15 pound line. Are you modifying the crankbaits at all, or is it straight out of the pack? Is there some hook changing taking place? Yeah. I mean, let's say there was a, let's say it was tournament time. We're not just out fun fishing. We, we gotta, we gotta do some damage here. Uh, what are you doing to your crankbaits? Uh, definitely changing out the treble hooks. Going to okay. put, you know, an EWG style hook on there. Sure. So, uh, once they, they eat it, they get stuck. Yeah. And uh, it, depending on the situation, if they were, uh, you know, if the water was real cold and they, they weren't eating it as well, I might add an extra split ring on the back hook to uh, give a little more forgiveness if, uh, you know, they were trying to throw that bait and only had one one or two little hooks in them. So, but, so adding a split ring, so you're just adding an extra one to the back? Yes. So is, is it? Are you matching up to the same size of the split ring that's on it, or is it a little bigger, a little smaller? What's your? I would go with the same size. Okay. But basically, just take your hook and split ring off of your bait, take a, a new split ring, add it onto your bait, and then take your split ring with your hook and add it onto that split ring. So then you have two, and it allows that hook to have a little more. Uh, forgiveness and freedom whenever a fish is trying to throw your bait. Sure, that makes sense. That's yeah. that's a that's a really good tip. Uh, do you apply that to all of your crankbaits, or, or when you run into those situations, is it more open water, or are are you doing this technique with a crankbait when you're fishing for a largemouth? For sure, yeah, I, I do that okay. often. You know, when whenever you're say ledge fishing or, or you know throwing a big crankbait mm -hmm. on the Tennessee River somewhere. Um, any little advantage you can get to keep a fish hooked. Sure. Yeah. I, I, that, no, that's that's important. Those little things, you know, I, I think you would agree the number one thing is the right rod and having yeah. that, you know, that the perfect bend, the perfect give when that fish charges at the boat. You know, you want to obviously get a, hot, uh, a solid hookup. You want to be able to fight that fish effectively. Now, these these fish on Lake Erie are you are do they, are they jumping? Are they coming out of the water when you hook them? Are they staying just digging? What's that normally that that whole fight entail when when you're cranking? Oh no, they go absolutely insane. Right, they'll come up yeah. out of the water. Yeah. Oh, they go nuts. Yeah, and sure. and those days I spoke of where where I landed ninety some. Uh, we probably lost another 30 or 40 sure. to the boat. But that's just the nature of it. Yeah, that's, cranking. The, that's yeah. the nature of cranking and smallmouth in general. You know, sure. they're wild to begin with. So you throw treble hooks in the mix and you're just asking for trouble. Right, right, right. No, absolutely. So once these fish start to move in and, and the water temp's warm, uh, they, they, go, they go do their thing. They start spawning. When they come back out, is that is that crankbait deal still as effective in you know 60 65 degree water uh do you start looking at different techniques after that yeah so once the the water warms up probably to 60 to 60 65 degrees you start getting some grass and slime growing on the bottom in that depth range so you can't really fish it as effective as in the spring sure so that's why it's more of a cold water technique you know in the spring and fall 
Gotcha. Um, sure. So yeah, you have to slide out a little deeper and uh, adjust your techniques a little bit after they spawn. Sure. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. So as we get into the summer months on Lake Erie, what would be your, uh, you know, as far as trying to locate smallmouth, obviously anyone who's who's a good smallmouth angler is going to rely heavily on their electronics. Uh, what type of electronics do you run currently today? And, you know, how do you have those? Uh, I mean, what's your game plan when you're going out looking for these massive schools of fish that are offshore yeah so electronics have really changed the game lately um i don't i don't know how you can do it without them right now sure i mean yeah um so yeah i'm i'm spending a lot of time idling once once the fish pull out and uh you know they've left the shallow haunts they're, they're kind of grouping up and heading out deeper to start feeding up for the summer. So I'm, I'm out there sitting in my, my chair, idling around looking for rock piles and looking for schools of fish, looking for bait fish that the bass are following. Mm -hmm. And uh, I, I run a little bit of everything on my boat, electronic okay. wise, but I utilize the Lowrance for mapping and, and uh, side imaging and sonar at the console. Okay, sure. So I'm using those two units to uh, find the fish and then once I find the location that I like, um, uh, you know, I'm stepping up to the front and utilizing a little bit of everything to find them and, and catch them. Sure. So I got to ask, what's a little bit of everything? What are we running? So uh, I'm running a uh, Humminbird with 360. Yep. Uh, a Garmin with Panoptics mm. and a uh, Lowrance with Down Imaging. Sure. On sure. The motor. So we got a little bit of everything. Wow. Okay. So you're set up right. Yeah. What are your thoughts so uh, the game is changing so fast with electronics. Um, <laughs> I guess we don't really know what's going to happen as far as who's got the best out there. You know, there's, there's some, wow. it, it seems right now that different companies have really good things about their electronics. And so that's the reason why we're a lot of guys that are, are effectively, you know, put in the work looking for these fish out offshore. You have to have different brands, it seems right now. Yeah, it, you know, not right now. Not one brand does it all the best. Right. Sure. And I mean, this is what I do for a living, so I need to have the best of everything. I, I cannot argue that. That makes the most sense. So, um, sure. you know, I have been under contract with their ants in the past, and it was kind of a handicap, you know, right. stuff, honestly. So, mm -hmm. um, I couldn't do it anymore right and i uh, don't want to put myself in that situation but sure like you what? said every every brand's coming out with their version of it now and uh who mm -hmm. knows which one is is going to be the best or right. better than the other but for me i'm going with what i know works and what i know um has worked in the past sure i know how to use it i know what i'm looking at so that's all that matters so sure. i'm going with that yeah, no, I I can I totally agree with uh, with that theory. It's just you're fortunate enough that you're not tied down and you're able to make, you know, those decisions on. Hey, I need three different brands here at at the front of the boat to uh, to do the job effectively. At least you know when it comes to smallmouth fishing. Uh, as far as Lake Erie, I, I I guess it's an amazing fishery. Would you say that's your favorite? body of water to fish i don't want to make assumptions but if you could choose like your your favorite smallmouth body of water anywhere in the country where would that be man that's a loaded question right it kind of goes back to what we talked about a second ago and like if i wanted to catch numbers yes it would be like here if okay. i wanted to catch a, a six pounder then it would probably be like ontario sure, sure. um if i had to pick a, a favorite most sentimental to me would be the Thousand Islands because I was fortunate enough to win mm -hmm. the, the series event there. And that's what totally launched my career and allowed me to start fishing full time. Sure. But it definitely means a lot to me. And that's probably my favorite. Wow. Okay. I, well, yeah. I can't, yeah, I can't blame you about that. So yeah. that's, uh, that's such a unique fishery. It's, uh, man, it, to, in my mind, I'm I'm in the same boat. I just I spent so much time on Lake Ontario and the St. Lawrence River. Oh yeah. 
that it's it, you know it just does something to you you know you just feel it's just driving up there you know you're super excited right i don't know what it is you can spend all day on the lake although conditions sometimes suck out there right yeah. uh, <laughs> but normally you can normally get out of the wind if you have to or or find a place to catch a fish or two um as far as i guess what would be your strengths when it comes to smallmouth fishing what what would you say hmm. your number you know number one number two what are some things that you really have high confidence in if you know that's the pattern or that's the bite you know you're super excited what would those techniques be uh if they're out deep you know finding deep. electronics and, and sure. vertical fishing okay yeah if they're doing that like i feel like i'm as good as anyone Sure. You know, I, I could compete with anything or, or find the areas or, you know. And it's so, so the deep fish we're talking about, uh, what techniques are coming into play? Most, I, I'm just, I don't want to assume again, but are, are we talking drop shots? Yeah. Or, and that's yeah. pretty much it. I mean, the deal with that is that it falls straight down every time. You know, if, if you were to try to vertically fish a, a tube or a Ned rig or something, a lot of times it likes to spiral on the way down. Sure. It could end up off to the side and, uh, you know, kind of glide away from the boat, away from the fish. Yeah. So the drop shot falls straight down every time, and, you know, it falls fast. You can you can use a real heavy weight, and when you see a fish on your screen, you can get it down there in a hurry. So sure. So let's the most efficient for me. Sure. So let's say we're out on Lake Ontario with you right now. We're looking for some fish. We're, we graft a few fish off of a ledge or whatever the case may be. Uh, seems like they're, they're holding in that 25 to 30 foot range. And we decided to take a drop shot out. Uh, where do you start as far as, uh, you know, let's just have the setup. As far as rod goes, uh, are you looking at like a medium or a medium light? Uh, how, how, what's the length of the rod and then what kind of line are we using for drop shotting? Yeah. So I'm going to go with a little bit shorter rod, you know, a, a seven foot seven, two, um, when you're fishing vertically, especially I like a little bit shorter rod because you don't realize it, but when you hold that rod out and go to drop down, it's, it's a few feet away from your trolling motor. So you can miss some fish. Sure. That shorter rod allows you to get it actually straight down under the boat. Mm -hmm. um, going with 20 pound Seaguar Smackdown braid and then probably eight pound Tatsu fluorocarbon leader. Okay. I'm um, tying an FG knot there. Sure. And uh, running that leader. And then I would run it to a, a Trocar number two drop shot hook. Okay. Half ounce weight. Half uh, ounce. Pretty, much, pretty much standard on the half ounce. Mm -hmm. I will go up to a three quarter or one ounce if it gets real rough, but sure. Yeah. Um, I just like the feel and the fall rate of the half ounce. So that's pretty much right. my go to. I found that that consistency too when you're drop shotting out there and, and just knowing that that's how the weight feels. Yes. Right. 100% because you get used to that feel and then you can you can detect that real spongy feeling or mm -hmm. you know, when a fish that feels just a little bit heavier you know, to, uh, to load up on them. So sure. it, that's very important. If you switch up your weights a lot, you know, you'll, you'll confuse yourself with that and miss some fish. Yeah, absolutely. Now, as, uh, as far as the lead from the, the weight to the hook, where would you ideally, you know, if you're, if you're packed up the night before you're going to go out, where would you start? See, this is something that a lot of people disagree with me about, but okay, honestly, I never really pay any attention to it. Really? Really? Like, the only time where I would pay attention to that is if there was a lot of grass. Okay. I'm trying to get that bait above the grass. If the grass, you know, say like a Lake St. Clair situation where it grows eight sure. inches off the bottom, I would make sure that my bait was above that grass. Sure. But, um, you know, standard, you know, Lake, yeah. Theory, so Lake you, Ontario. So you could be anywhere from anywhere eight from inches to two feet. Yep. Somewhere in however there. I tie it up, I just, just roll with it. And then sure. You know, once it gets too short, I'll retie it or whatever. But right, right. I, I probably don't use it much under, you know, like you said, eight inches. Right. Seven, eight inches. But yep, yep, yep. Um, yeah, I really don't pay much attention to that. And of course, I mean, there's going to be some situations where these fish might be a little bit higher in the water column, and you'll want to take note of that and, and yeah. make your adjustments. 
But yeah, typically when you're when you're dealing with deep fish, they're pretty much concentrated at the bottom. I'm assuming you're using a lot of goby imitators. I could be wrong. Um, as far as baits go, uh, you know, what would be your ideal setup as far as baits when, when you're targeting those deeper fish? Yeah, I mean, I've I've messed with them all, mm -hmm. and I've caught fish on them all. So sure, it, yeah. I think it's more of just a confidence thing. Yep. And uh, what what you feel like is going to get the most bites, and for me, that's just been a shad shaped worm. Okay, sure. You know, I'll mix the keller up based on uh, forage or, or what's around and time mm -hmm. of year and stuff. But um, generally, yeah, I'm just going with a shad shaped worm. If you could have one drop shot bait that you you have, you're going to use. Like this is it. You're going out for the day. This is all you can bring along. What what are you bringing? What color well, and what bait? Yeah, it would be a shad-shaped worm and uh, probably green pumpkin candy. Okay, what brand? Yamamoto. Gotcha. Shad-shaped gotcha. worm, yeah. Gotcha. Oh, that's what it's called? Yeah, that's what they're called. All right, well, what do I know? Shit. Yeah. Oh, you're, you're <laughs> on the, the gadjo. I know. I'm I'm on the uh, – no, to, to be honest with you, I love a goby imitator, but there's times, and I've seen it firsthand, where some type of shad, even like a – a fluke style bait yeah. or a you know can can outfish those goby imitators and it varies you know from day to day and lake to lake and conditions and things like that right but um you know smallmouth are normally aggressive the cool thing when you find them out deep oftentimes not every time but often you can get them to bite and have a pretty successful day out there once you put the time in to find these things you know i mean sure. what's your sure biggest uh yeah, let's say you have a, a a pot of fish located, and you have a tournament, and it's two three days away. Yeah. What's your biggest fear, or what what are your thoughts? Are, is it are you pretty confident those fish will be there, or are you looking for new spots? Are you are you continuing your search? Uh, you know, what, walk me through that if you do find a big group of fish. Well, yeah, you know, the Great Lakes is always. Uh the Great Lakes events, tournaments are always a little bit different than everywhere else because uh, the weather could change. The wind could blow one direction and, and you can't even get to where you want to go. Mm -hmm. you, know, you could be faced with five, six foot waves and have to run 30 or 40 miles in that. So mm -hmm. it, it'd be a little bit of a battle just getting to them. Mm -hmm. So that's mm -hmm. always in the back of your mind, but um, I'm one of the crazier ones. So if I find something, I'm usually – trying to get there even if i only get an hour or so to fish you're committed to it yes yes yeah. and uh honestly i mean in those types of situations um it can get pretty pretty hot and heavy fast sure you don't need very long to fish and you can win off of one one spot mm -hmm. i agree you, you don't need many spots you can win off of one one school or, or one spot mm -hmm. hey, as far as so so lake ontario for the listeners that are not really familiar how it sets up, you know, it's, it's, a, it's obviously a great lakes, but there's also the St. Lawrence river that it flows, that water flows through from Lake Ontario out to the ocean. Basically the whole area has a lot of fish. Uh, if you were targeting, you know, uh, going up there, fun fishing, or even for a tournament, are you going to be poking around the river or with ideal conditions, you can go wherever you want, or are you going to yeah. be out on the lake? So I'm going to be in the lake. Um, it, it's a little easier to fish vertically out in the lake. Once you, you venture into the river, there's so much current. It's a little bit harder to get set up to fish actually vertically. you got to drift and uh, drag. So that's not my preferred way. Sure. I will definitely do it if I have to or if mm -hmm. you know, there's the bigger fish are easier to catch in there. But if I had it my way, I, I would be – in the lake right right what are some areas as far as you know we talked about your strengths fishing deep sounds like you got the crankbait deal dialed in what would be some areas that you would you know maybe improve upon or some techniques that you know are effective you just don't use it that often what are some things that you wish or or you you would like to maybe step it up a little bit more if you could i would like to have some more experience with the the shallow sight fishing when they're cruising Sure. Okay. Whether it's, you know, throughout later summer into the fall, whenever they get up on, on the sand flats, mm -hmm. I've done it and I've, you know, I've caught some fish that way, but I just don't have a whole lot of experience with it. Sure. And 
it's a lot of fun. You know, I love looking at them in the spring yeah. when they're spawning. Right. So um, I think it'd be cool to uh, do that and just kind of drop a bait in front of their nose or, or throw a hair jig or something at them. Just something yeah. that I don't have a whole lot of experience with. Sure. Well, a lot of times, like it's so condition oriented, you really want to have that high sun right. and that that calm conditions. So, a lot of times, you don't. You might have the intentions of going out looking for shallow fish, and the weather's just not going to allow you to do that. If it's cloudy out and you're fishing an area and you're searching for shallow fish, that you, you know, you're just you're taking a gamble. You 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 picked out a spot on the map and you said this looks like there should be an area where some fish could come up shallow. You don't know. If you're fishing under the wrong conditions, you're pretty much wasting your time uh, if you can't get a good visual on those fish. I mean, obviously, you can fan cast and hope to come across something, but uh, in every lake's different. It seems like Lake Ontario, you know, there's oftentimes they're not really grouped up either. You're looking for that one big fish every couple hundred yards yeah just a big single but still that, that's yeah. more like hunting and i feel like yeah. it's pretty cool it's fun so you don't get that opportunity really on on the lake erie uh, where you fish out of it is it just the algae bloom and things like that later in the summer yeah, yeah. so it doesn't necessarily have the current like ontario and uh mm -hmm. st lawrence do so the water gets stirred up based on the wind sure and sure. it won't have that same visibility right Right. And there really isn't some of those same shallow flats. Yeah, exactly. The good bottom composition that you're looking for. Sure, sure. What are some other techniques that you really enjoy uh, as far as targeting smallmouth besides besides a crankbait, a drop shot? Uh, do you do a lot? Of, do you drag a lot? Or are you working some bottom baits, some finesse baits, or are, are you are you begging if you can find a jerk bait bite or maybe a spinner bait bite? Yeah, you know, I what mean, would be your next go to? Yeah, all of it, honestly. Um, that that pretty much covers my my Great Lakes smallmouth. That's pretty much either a drop shot, a jerk bait, or a crankbait. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. That's pretty much all I'm doing on the Great Lakes. Um, once you venture into say like river smallmouth and stuff, I love throwing top water for them. Sure. You know they kind of set up in little current breaks and stuff like that, and you can catch them on top water. Right. It's a lot of fun, but that's a whole different ball game. That they they should be two different species, honestly. Sure. Sure. As far as top water, what's your go-to top water bait? Uh, I like a little pop bar. Okay. I go with the yellow magic. Yeah, definitely. A little yellow magic pop bar, and yeah, uh, yeah. They they eat it. Do you like standard bait fish colors like a Tennessee yeah. shad or a bone white? Yeah, just standard standard. Okay, sure. Yeah, colors. Now. You know, growing up in, in Pennsylvania, fishing the Great Lakes, now you're on tour. You get to experience a lot of different bodies of water. Have you have you kind of dabbled in some smallmouth fishing in other parts of the country? And, and if so, what, what bodies of water have you been pretty impressed with as far as uh, the smallmouth that are in them? Yeah, I mean, we ran into them all over the place. Uh, we had a good event at Cherokee last year. That really showed out with uh, its smallmouth population. Mm -hmm. um, I was pretty impressed with that. Um, you know, Lake Cumberland's full of smallmouth. Dale Hollow's full of, full of big smallmouth. Um, they're, they're a whole different breed. They, they act completely different than uh, great sure. smallmouth. So it was a little bit of a learning curve for me, actually, because I kind of jumped into those lakes expecting them to set up and act the same way as they do up north, but they really don't at all. Uh-huh. What would be the what? How would you target something like that? I know everything's a little different, but is it more reaction baits, or are you are you dragging and, and drop shotting to those fish as well? Um, yeah, so little of both. I mean, the, the the event at Cherokee, they were all spawning, so that was all bottom oriented stuff. Um, you know, Lake Cumberland. The, the, now, were you sight fishing those? Could you see them or no? No, you couldn't see them. So okay. the water was pretty stained. Um, how did you? How would you even approach that? So it's a spawning event. You know they're spawning, but you cannot see them. That's like foreign for guys like us who fish clear water, right? I, it was. What do you do? <laughs> well, it was uh, it was very weird. They, they were set up on very bluffy rock, so it's okay. pretty vertical, and uh, there'd be little little slots in between the rock, and sure. uh, you could put your bait in there, and there would be a, a fish spawning in there, and. Uh, wow. You couldn't tell that, you know, there was a bed there. You couldn't see anything. But 
Um, you just had to be very aware and, and pitch in there, get a bite, miss them, throw back in there, get another bite. So okay. Not like, hey, the, he's spawning in there, like, or sure. you know, catch the the same fish a couple times. And, and were were you able to to mark? areas where you knew they were on beds even though you couldn't see them and go back in that event and catch them yes for okay. sure for sure and and catch the the same fish you know multiple days in a row or, or whatnot sure so practice had to have been man i wouldn't even know i would not have uh that would have been tough it I was mean, super different. slow right you're yes it was yeah. very different um because like i said you couldn't see them so right it was very hard to figure that out because it like me being fast paced in nature, I just wanted to keep moving and moving and, and find yep. something. But you finally had to settle down and, and it took a little bit of figuring out, but finally figured out that they were spawning. Sure. And we had perfect conditions in that event and uh, more fish kept moving up as okay. the event went on. So they sure. didn't really get beat up like they should have. Yeah, that makes sense. As far as uh, have, have you fished any of the like Tennessee rivers? I know Pickwick and Wheeler, places like that have some giant smallmouth. Were you able to experience any of that? I have. I've fished all those Pickwick and Wilson, been to the, the spillways there and, and mm -hmm. done the swim bait thing. Sure. Um, that That's pretty fun. That's a whole different animal as Isn't well. Isn't it? Yeah, it really and is. It, there's a science to all those techniques, and, and it yeah. really takes some, some time to dial it in. Sure. But yeah, I had a couple of good days down there on, on Pickwick and uh, Wilson for sure. Do you think a, a an angler coming from the south to the Great Lakes versus an angler coming from the Great Lakes to the south, who has the advantage? I would say an angler from the north going to the south. Okay. Sure. I, I Just my opinion on it because it, a lot of the guys from south come up to these giant bodies of water and just get overwhelmed with it or overwhelmed right. with the weather and uh they're just kind of sure overcomplicated right right well i mean you have to have if you're going to venture out in the great lakes and and experience some of the great smallmouth you know you have to have in your head right off the bat that there's going to be days you can't get to where you want to go safely for sure there's going to be times it's where it's, right right protect it you know half sure three quarters of the year yeah mother nature throws curves in and uh you might not be able to make that 20 mile trip offshore that day right but there's times when you you, you just go because you know what's the gold mine that's waiting and you know preparation obviously comes into play there learning knowing how to run a, a boat in big waves yeah uh you know bass boats they you know a lot of people say they're not made for those big waters but i mean it, they are uh hey. you just you got to know how to to work it how to maneuver them uh you know and there's a lot of a lot of issues that do come up when you're out there as far as making sure your equipment's in working order top knock not you know you don't want your bilge pumps going out on you things like right. that what are some key pieces of equipment that you have on your boat when it comes to fishing big water that some people might overlook if they're thinking about coming up to the great lakes for the first time yeah so well you definitely need your safety equipment you know flares and and fire extinguishers all that kind of stuff because sure. the coast guard is on you there yes there. yes <laughs> you got to have your uh, battery terminals uh covered and all that Yes. which uh which is smart but yes they do they do check a little bit more up on the great lakes because they know the stuff that can go down for sure uh, they're out there they're watching watching you know making sure everything's uh you know it's it's a whole nother beast it's the ocean basically it's the uh it really is. it's the it's ocean really longer shaft on the trolling motor yeah, you know you, you want to invest in that it, you know if you're fishing in the deeper water and uh honestly <clears throat> one of the probably the most overlooked thing would be a hydraulic jack plate sure so you can lower your motor down and get better bite on your prop and, and have more uh, grip to climb those waves right right now everyone thinks of a, a jack plate is uh for shallow water but I, I honestly think i use mine more in in the the big waves than i do in the shallow water definitely it makes sense and then of course fish care running those big waves come into play a lot of these deep water fish need to be fizzed properly, so you want to yes. you want to be able to have that equipment on but board. When you have a nice bag of smallmouth, of course, ice, and then some type of treatment for your live well, I yeah. find seems to work. Keeps you those need, fish. You need all that. We we gotta save the resource that that's there. You know, it, 
Yeah. Put those big, beautiful smallmouth, and you just take care of them. Sure. What do you think the future is as far as the Great Lakes? Do you, do you, you know, I, I, I don't know if you've if you've been on Lake Ontario at all in 2020 or, or as often as you'd like, but I oh. experienced uh, not the greatest fishing this year, and you know, has me a little concerned. I, I'm just hoping it's an off year, and it was a fluke. But when you start, when you when you ha- experience so many great years, and then all of a sudden, you know, uh, of course we could not fish in Canada this year, but there's plenty of water in the U.S. side. It just seemed off to me, and I don't know. Was Lake Erie was it was it a good year in 2020 on Lake Erie for you? Was it slightly off? Was it something all the Great Lakes are experiencing? What are your thoughts? I'm sure you've talked to some people and heard about yeah. uh, the fishing on Lake Ontario in 2020. Yes, I, I've heard about it. I've talked about it, and I've thought about it myself a lot. And as much as I hate to say it, I think it may have peaked up that area. Um, Kind of Lake Erie went through this a, a few years ago. Okay. And uh, it, this year was the best year I've seen in wow. the recent history. That's good news for Lake Erie. Numbers yeah. and, uh, you know, size. Mm-hmm. So, yeah, it's that's good news for that. Um, a lot of it seems to be uh, different sections of the lake, especially sure. Lake Erie will be on. You know, the, the western basin will be tough, but the eastern basin will be on and kind of press gal bays in between the two so i don't know if it's just a cycle of the fish going on or whatnot but sure um, now i'm curious if you had if if you could launch and fish anywhere on lake erie let's say buffalo press isle sandusky or the mouth of the detroit river where would you where do you think you have the most fun and can, can put a big bag together buffalo buffalo for sure 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 yep, yep. Yeah, that's uh, more to offer structure wise and a lot of fish. Sure. Yeah, that's uh, that's what I was going to say. I, I've only been out there a handful of times, but from what I've seen, it's uh, it's exciting. You know, it really is. There's some there's some good. There's a lot of four. Like we said, there's a lot of four or five pounders out there uh, and some big weight. Now, I saw some some huge weights this past fall out of I Buffalo. <laughs> right. I mean, pounds. crazy, yeah. crazy. And I don't think they're in Canada either. It's oh, no. all the U.S. side. So the U.S. Yeah, it's 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 crazy. So that leads to my next question: What is what's your personal best smallmouth? So I actually caught it at Thousand Islands. As okay. Well, it was I waded in, in in one of the Costa series. It was six eleven. Damn. Yeah. That's yeah. a good fish. Yeah, I actually have caught two that were six eleven. Six eleven. Sure. One, one in a tournament and one in a, a practice. What did you catch them on? They were both on the same same thing. What, what I told you earlier. Really? Shape worm. Yep. All right, I gotta take note of that. Yeah, you don't need any help. Well, <laughs> are you nose hooking that all the way through? Yeah. Yes. You are. Yes. Okay. Okay. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So I've got a handful of uh, six and a half this year, but I I cannot break that seven pound mark. Well, it's yeah. I mean, <laughs> it's a big fish, right? That's a giant fish. It's yeah. a giant fish. It's a giant fish. I'm actually. Uh, well, I, I'm eight eight even Sturgeon Bay. Woo! Yeah, years yeah. ago, years ago, it's hard. Yeah. Um, seven pounder on Lake Ontario is doable, but you know they're out there. Yeah, the state record isn't too far off from that, and I'm I'm surprised right. that the number of big fish that are out there. I mean, I honestly, I I feel there's a thousand plus state records swimming around lake ontario maybe not a thousand five hundred okay i mean there's there's a lot more than people think sure I, and it's just a matter of time yes yes they're just they're rogues you know it would be somebody who is not fishing for small mobs, sure <laughs> just randomly catches the thing yeah, exactly one for salmon or something and catch this trash eight pound small mob and- right right so this so the 611 you caught in the tournament your biggest smallmouth what where what, obviously your drop shine for it did you see it on the graph how deep of water were you in it walk me through that because this was a tournament right this was a tournament. so you had a co-angler with you i did with the net you got this big fish on so how did it play out 
Honestly, it wasn't that exciting. Okay. <laughs> I seen a mark on my graph and uh, dropped down to him. He didn't bite. I, I wound it back up, dropped back down to him again. Didn't bite the second time. Tried it a third time, and he bit it the third time. And uh, I honestly thought it was a walleye. Okay. It, it was just kind of coming in like a dead log. Sure. Just kind of dead weight coming up, and it got up to the, the side of the boat and just kind of laid there, and he scooped him up. Why I mean, can't was, they all be like that? I know. It was the most uneventful battle I've ever had. And then, right. Like, once, once so you got him in the net. Then now you're like, did you already have a limit? I did, yes. So, okay. So, a good yeah, limit? I, I did. I did. I, I had a, a pretty big bag already. So I, my smallest fish was like a three and a half pounder, I think. Sure. And I went back there and, and laid them side by side, and it was almost twice as big as them. I was like, holy crap. Yeah. I didn't realize it was that big. Right, right. No, that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> I, I wish they would yeah. all just come up that I know, easy. That, that bolstered me. I, I think I had 26.2 that day. That was, that's my biggest bag of smallmouth ever weighed in. Sure, sure. So, yeah, that was a good day. Yep, yep. So the next question here, we know your biggest smallmouth. If you could only use one bait ever again for a smallmouth, what's it going to be? Mm, drop shot with the shad shape really yeah okay and that, the juice you got ball. some major confidence in this bait i told you it's all confidence yeah i mean a lot of fishing in general is all confidence but especially smallmouth fishing it's all confidence so yeah sure sure roll with what works i can't disagree what separates some of the top anglers in your mind in the country uh when it comes to smallmouth fishing uh, you know, what, what's the reason, you know, there's a handful of guys that, you know, they're showing up for an event, whether it be on the great lakes or any smallmouth fishery, they're going to dominate. What do you think mm -hmm. the reason is? Because is it just their, ex they, their experience out there? They just, they've been around the different situations. Yeah. Um, I think, uh, it's a little bit, of all of that experience for sure. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, growing up up north or <clears throat> doing it all the time, just you have a, a huge advantage against somebody who's never done it. And it, it goes back to the confidence thing and just knowing that if I keep staring at my graphs, I'm going to find a group of them somewhere. Sure. They're going to be pretty easy to catch. And well, I'm gonna, like, hey, you brought up a point that, that I, I want to circle back around when you when you caught that big fish. You said you dropped to it three times. Yeah. So is that something people need to be looking at when they see one on the graph? Is it, is it, is it a different, do you find it, you'll get a bite more if you just reel up and drop or if you just dead stick it and wait? Or, or what was the reasoning be, be, behind mm -hmm. reeling it up again, dropping it on that fish, as opposed to just sitting it there and hoping he bites? See, now you're digging deep into my tricks. I don't think I can tell you this. Well, we have to. we got to be open here. <laughs> so, yeah, I mean, my opinion on this is I think it is like 95% of the time a reaction bite of that thing falling down in front of their face. Sure. So the more times you wind up and drop down, the better shot you have of catching them. Mm -hmm. so have you I, found some situations where dead sticking was more worked a little bit better, or is it? Or is that just a pretty much standard way that you like to fish deep? If there is a, you know, a big number of fish just sitting in the one area, I will dead stick a little bit. Okay. But honestly, most of the time I am, I'm not letting that bait sit very long at all. Wow. It is sure. more of a, an initial drop. Yep. Bite. And it, yep. you know, even if, um, it's not a reaction thing. That's just my opinion. You, you know, I really don't know what's going on down there. Um, sure. You know, the, you would think they're very aware, but you could drop your bait down three times and it would hit a different spot. And exactly. it would vision, you know, one yeah. of the times. And, if, they're uh, not, if they're positioned this way, yeah. you know, you're in 30 feet of water, that bait drops over here. Right, they can't do that. Yep. So Absolutely. that's just my opinion on it. Like the more the more drops you make, the more chances you have on seeing it. Sure, sure. Or the same fish seeing it and right. not eating it. Because yeah. usually they don't think about it too much. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And, and then it leads to my la last question. What do you think, what makes you successful a as, you know, one of the top smallmouth bass anglers in the country? Where does, where does that come from? 
Mm, probably just confidence in myself. Sure. Sure. You know, just like I said, you know, I, if there's a smallmouth event in the summer that I'm looking at my grass, like mm -hmm. I know I can sit there and I will find them. Like it's just yeah. a matter of time. I just have to keep looking and keep looking. It's just confidence and in, in knowing that and to be able to keep doing it that allows you to be successful. Whereas someone who wasn't so confident in that would do it for half hour and not find anything get discouraged and go look at something else and you know a lot of times there's a lot of dead water so you have yeah. to be very committed and confident in it to uh make it happen mm -hmm. a lot of idle time just behind the yeah. steering wheel looking yes yeah, so i think we'll put almost 300 hours on my motor this year idling. sure so unreal <laughs> you just gotta be committed to it yes you do you ever fall asleep idling I have. Yes, <laughs> I think we all have. I have Lake Chickamauga this year. I, I actually bumped into a, a <laughs> channel to woke me up. Few of yeah. us have been there before. I know We've what you all mean. Been there. It happens. Exactly, exactly. Well, hey, good luck this year, man. I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast. I think I think the uh, the listeners got a, a, a couple really good tips that they can take out next time they decide to go offshore. Look for some of these big fish. Hey, I'm I'm excited about this little crankbait deal you talked about. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that's an effective technique that that guys can key on all over the country when it comes to smallmouth fishing. And uh, again, thank you for coming on. You're always welcome back. I appreciate it. Yeah, awesome. anytime you want to talk fishing, I'm always available. Sounds good. Now, how can people get a hold of you? What's the best way to find you on social media? I'm on all the social medias, uh, Matt Becker Fishing on uh, Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, all that. So I just uh, trying to pump out some content and uh, travel the country, catch some bass everywhere. So, yeah, appreciate everyone following along. Definitely. We're going to have all that information uh, in the description below if you want to follow Matt. All right, buddy. Okay, I'll talk to you. All right, thanks. See you. Well, I just want to thank Matt for hanging out with us on the podcast. Some good tips. Listen, that's shallow water crankbait deal. Uh, 8 to 15 foot range pre-spawn. 50 degree water, 55 degree water temp. That's the deal. That's a technique that's not utilized as often. And it sounds like he really does have that dialed in. With Epic Eric, I have a blast doing that. It's totally different format than what we just talked about here with Matt. But the live is where it's at. So if you guys are listening to this on audio, make some time. Clear your schedule. Watch the reruns. I appreciate the support, guys. Well, hey, thanks for listening on the podcast as well as watching on the YouTube channel. If you could follow us on Instagram at Smallmouth Crush. Next week's podcast is going to be awesome. I have no idea who we're going to have on, but we're going to figure it out. Don't forget to check out our live streams every Thursday, 8.30 Eastern, on my YouTube channel, Smallmouth Crush. It gets crazy, okay? Be prepared. Be prepared to just hang out, talk fishing, and whatever else we want to talk about. Thanks so much for listening today. Make sure that you're subscribed to the show and follow us on Instagram at Small Mouth Crush. Also, the YouTube channel, Small Mouth Crush. And if you feel so inclined, please leave us a five-star rating and comment with a review below. And as always, until next time, we'll see you on the water.